Namaste everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host Kushal Mehra. My guest today is Dr. Michael Shermer. Dr. Shermer is an American science writer and a historian of science. He's the founder of the Skeptic Society and the editor in chief of its magazine Skeptic. He teaches a yearly critical thinking course called Skepticism 101 at Chapman University, California. He's the host of a famous podcast called The Science Salon which I actually listen to regularly and he's an author of several books which are, some of them I even have read but today we're going to talk about his latest book giving the devil his due reflections of a scientific humanist dr shomer thanks thank you very much for coming on the podcast oh nice to see you thanks for having me so dr shomer i wanted to start by asking you the first question which was uh, obviously this book is a collation of a lot of your previous work a lot of the articles that you've written over the years so So I actually wanted to start with why did you feel the need that you needed to collate these things and revisit yeah. them and Yep so there's the book and the devil <laughs> as portrayed in the shadow here um is anyone that you disagree with that you don't like that says something that you find reprehensible or disagreeable in some way uh which is basically everybody that is at some point you'll disagree with somebody uh, pretty much everybody about something and the reason i put this book together was because um traditionally free speech has been defended by liberals and and classical liberals and progressives and those on the left and but something's happened in the last decade or two in which now it's the right and conservatives defending free speech and liberals that have become censorious that is to say they want to censor uh hate speech and and people that they find deplorable or hateful or uh bigoted or racist or misogynist or or whatever and while that may sound good in principle like yeah we don't want to you know hear from people that are hateful and that use the n word and things like that um which i i get totally of course uh but in fact the problem with that is that once you go down the road of uh censoring people then uh you know what happens when it turns on you and you become the person um that is saying something that the majority finds disagreeable or hate speech or whatever then you've already signed off on censorship so there's no reason why you shouldn't be silenced So my argument is that we should give the devil his due for our own safety sake that is to say when you're the devil which of course we all will be at some point when when other people find what we have to say um you know that is disagreeable so uh, that that's the core argument All right Dr. Sharma so obviously your book is divided into five parts but what stood out for me personally because I live in a country and and I'm being very honest with you we don't have free speech in India the way yeah, you guys have it in America so so yeah, just to give you a brief idea so we have laws like section 124 which is a sedition law so basically uh, the state can just put you into jail thinking that you're quote and quote anti national or, or or a lot of things we have blasphemy laws in India from the British times something like 295A or just something like 153a which is this oh you're disturbing public order and people are just randomly and each and every political outfit in india is guilty of uh, exploiting such laws so when i was going through this chapter what uh, the first six chapters which is part of the first section what stood out to me was the way you were presenting free speech but at the same time uh, uh, i mean america being the central focus of the world the globe the, the entire globe kind of follows american politics and what i look at uh, american politics happening today is somehow in my view the orthodoxy has kind of shifted previously if i remember i mean when i used to grow up i remember there were songs by these rappers to uh, i think well, what was that uh, in the late 80s there was I- ice cube and dr dre and all those people used yeah, to come around yeah. and there were the conservatives who were like oh this music yeah. is the music of the devil and uh, right. we don't like that we don't like that and we want it banned but somehow the culture the orthodoxy has changed so so why do you think the orthodoxy has shif- shifted from the conservatives in america to the liberals in america now Yeah, you could go back further than that. In the 80s there was concerns about uh, rock lyrics being satanic like uh, Led Zeppelin uh, and uh, the Rolling Stones were supposedly uh, corrupting the youth with their lyrics. Yeah. And uh, therefore they should be silenced. Or Madonna's uh, music videos in the 90s were very controversial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was conservatives that were mostly uh, censorious and it was the liberals who were defending 
artists' right to express themselves and so on. Now it's rather in the reverse, uh, which is a concern of mine. Anyway, uh, actually, that that argument that you uh, described as being uh, built into Indian law actually has precedent here in the United States. And that's why I opened the book with uh, on page one with this uh, famous Supreme Court decision in 1919 called Schenck versus the United States. Uh, and this is where Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes made his famous uh, statement that's quoted all the time, very, very famously. He writes in this decision, which I'll describe in a moment, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. The question in every case is whether the words used are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. So those two phrases, falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic and clear and present danger. Okay, what was this clear and present danger that was the equivalent of shouting fire in a, in a theater and causing a panic? This guy named Charles Schenck was head of the Socialist Party in Philadelphia, and he was handing out um, flyers to draft age men. Now, at the time, conscription was the law. That is, the government could force you to go to war. And this is uh, the time that Schenck was doing this was when the United States was gearing up to enter the First World War which at the time was just you know a, another European conflict that, that a lot of Americans didn't think we had any business going into. So um, the United States passed uh, conscription, that, that, that therefore the government could temporarily own your body. And Schenck argued that that's unconstitutional because the 13th Amendment prohibits involuntary servitude or slavery. And, and so he passed out these flyers that basically reminded people uh, you, you know, this is unconstitutional. You, you should not do this. You should resist the draft. Now, today, that doesn't sound all that big a deal after Vietnam and all the uh, draft dodgers and, 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 and draft card burners and, and people that ran off to Canada and so on. Yeah, by the way, I missed the draft by about two months, but based wow. it, it ended when I came of age to be drafted into Vietnam. Yeah. Oh, boy. Anyway, um, this is what Shank was uh, convicted of treason for and, and uh, silenced and said uh, it was claimed that he was causing a clear and present danger to the United States security. Uh, that is by protesting the draft. Okay, this is crazy. This is, in, in fact, exactly what uh, the First Amendment protects, the other part of the First Amendment, that is the right to uh, peacefully assemble and protest actions by the government. And uh, handing out flyers is peaceful protesting. You know, there's no violence there. But here you see the shift from talking about words as violence and that's what's happened on the left in the last 20 years or so. The equation of language with physical violence. And so I'm very critical of this. I think that's going too far. But if you track it back, you'll see that it was done with good intentions. That is to say, you know, you shouldn't call African Americans the N word. And you shouldn't call women the C word. And you shouldn't call Jews kikes and Asians gooks and, and, and so forth. And, and almost everybody will go, yeah, yeah, of course, that, you know, that's, that's abhorrent. I would never do that. It, but that's our modern, you know, sensibilities. You know, th those words were used pretty commonly going back, say, the last uh, century or so, except for the last 20 years or so. So, you know, making that argument. But then from there, you, you go to phrases and sentences and, and very thoughts or ideas that become um, considered dangerous, a clear and present danger. Therefore, they should be outlawed. And then all of a sudden you have the thought police and the language police and you have all uh, this campus craziness of uh, safe spaces from so students don't have to hear a speaker. Maybe it's a conservative like Charles Murray that wants to speak on a campus or Heather McDonald and they're, and they're deplatformed or, or the heckler's veto. They come in and shout them out with, with noisemakers and, and chants and, um, so anyway, the, the whole first part of my book is to kind of push back against that and, and describe what went wrong. The left just went off the rails here. They started off with good intentions and then lost their way by, by, by setting up this category, this bin in which we're going to put 
things we don't like, like the N word. Okay. Yeah, that's for sure goes in there. But all of a sudden the bin gets larger and larger and larger until you get this list of microaggressions that I reprinted in the book from the University of California system yeah. in which students and faculty and, and administrators that said, here's a list of things that are offensive to uh, other people. And wow, it just goes on for pages and pages. It's like, this is just crazy. Like asking, you know, where are you from? Uh, or, oh, you're good at math. Or, you know, I, uh, I, I think I don't uh, see color when I look at people. These are all allegedly offensive things. And, uh, and so pretty soon students are now just self-censoring. They're afraid to say anything because they, you know, something they say may be on the list and they may get in trouble for it. And, and I don't mean in trouble legally. It's not like the government's going to come in and arrest you like the problem you described in your country. Yeah. But the cancel culture of social media is so powerful now that people are afraid to say anything. You know, as you know, we're going through the Black Lives Movement, um, uh, Black Lives Matter movement right now in the last few weeks. And people are very, very worried about speaking out on social media. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, you know, it's just, it, it's just very problematic that you might get canceled. There are people losing their jobs. There are people whose spouses are losing their jobs uh, for uh, them uh, being affiliated with somebody who said something offensive. Okay. So this has real world consequences, and I, I think we need to push back against that. So what I hear from you, and obviously you follow, one follows American politics, what I find is actually, uh, and, and, and I wanted to know your views on the same, that it seems like a new religion is back in town. It, it, it sounds very much like mm -hmm. the old religion where there is blasphemy. It's just that blasphemy is of a different kind. And uh, there's yes. the original sin where the original sin has been replaced by Eve uh, with the privilege or maybe white privilege or whatever you want to call it. And, and there's this new God and there you have to pray to the new God. So so is there uh, is there a crisis of meaning in American society? Um, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, it is a kind of a secular religion. Uh, original sin is uh, that we're all racists and bigots at heart, and that the only way to absolve your sin is to admit it and just confess it, and then go to go to go to church for redemption. That is to say, take the courses in sensitivity training and read all the books about racism and so on. Now, on the one hand, I think that's way overboard. Uh, as well as like taking down every last statue and and basically erasing history, you know that goes too far. But again, you know it's grounded in in some good ideas. You know that racism has been a problem historically, um, and it hasn't completely gone away. So, like in my book, the moral arc, uh, there, <laughs> uh, you know, I track all the progress we've made in, in uh, on those fronts. But that's not to say that uh, there is no more racism. Or that there are no more evils or, or problems. There are, but but that but that we've made progress doesn't mean it's perfect. We we have not reached utopia, and we should not be aiming for that. But uh, you know that said, this is uh, you know it's it's kind of a, almost a religious impulse to purge uh, your group of people that are impure. You know, so you see that in religious movements, and now you see that in secular movements. You know, atheism went through that um, back in the uh, 2000s when after Richard Dawkins' book was published, uh, The God Delusion, you know, it kind of drove people into different camps. Like, should you be militant about your atheism, like maybe Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins, and, and, or should you be more conciliatory, you know, so that there was kind of divisions there. And then it split up again when social justice movement took off within the atheism movement. So there became this thing called atheism plus, the plus is social justice, yeah. which translated is far left progressive politics. This is a big mistake because there, you know, we're a small tent. We want to have a big tent and, you know, kicking people out of the atheist movement, which is sort of problematic anyway, because there's no such thing as atheism as a set of beliefs. It's just, we just don't believe in God full stop. It's more like humanism. And when humanism is hijacked and uh, kind of driven to to the far left politically, you're now going to not 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 only are you not going to appeal to anyone on the right, you're going to lose all the centrists who would be uh, in support of your movement. You know, so you know th that kind of thing is very common. Feminism went through that. Marxism went through it. Ayn Rand's objectivism went through it. You know, there's these purges. 
very much like religion, Middle Ages religion, you know, where people are purged who are not pure enough. And, uh, you know, that's just crazy. It seems to be almost a law of human nature that this is what social groups do. And I think it's a problem. And um, I, I have no doubt that, the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement will also go through this. You know, who's a pure Black Lives Matter uh, member and who is not and who, who dared to speak to some white person or embrace some statue that they shouldn't have or they like the wrong songs and boom, they're out. You know, this just happens with all social movements and that's unfortunate. So what I find fascinating is that, it, uh, the, I mean, I've been reading your work now for some time. So you uh, you spoke about neo neo atheism. So my own experience. I mean, I'm a skeptic myself, and uh, I actually don't avoid the tag atheist for myself. And my own personal journey went from you know following Dawkins, Hitchens, and while I was reading you, and I always find uh, found your work n not to be exactly very parallel to the neo atheist movement. In fact, I don't see uh, at least in popular discussion, you've never been clubbed in the neo atheist movement. You've always been kind of more on the uh, I would say the new atheist movement is anti-theism and I never found you to be personally be very anti-theism per se. So so where do you think does one draw the line? Because I wanted to connect this to something you talk about in your book about uh, something about meaning and you you quote, uh, you call something called the Alvi's, uh, uh, Alvi's error, right? Uh, you talk yeah, about yeah. that. So, yeah. so I actually wanted you to explain that and connect this to uh, the, the entire movement of neo atheism that what is this impulse that what drives us to something like this where we become so rigid in our mentality? Yeah, I'm glad you made that observation because I haven't really considered myself one of the new atheists in in that uh, how how it was interpreted. There's first of all, there's nothing new about the modern atheism. It's you know it's the same arguments that yeah. David Hume was making and Bertrand Russell and and, and so on. Um, uh, and and also the kind of militancy um, that some of the new atheism has uh, has produced is not really my strategy, nor is it even really in my temperament. Um, I've been pretty critical of religion throughout my career, but but only the ideas, not the people, not you know, not the social movement per se. I'm always willing to acknowledge when religion does good. On um, balance, I think we're better off without it. But you know. But that said, there's a lot of things that does good. So we have to acknowledge that. In any case, my approach is more like that of Gould and Stephen Jay Gould and Carl Sagan. You know, Sagan used to make the argument that, you know, if we want to rid the world of nuclear weapons and, and we want to, you know, cut back on uh, CO2 gases to deal with climate change and so forth, we need the Christians and the Jews and the Muslims and we need the Buddhists and the Hindus. We need everybody on board with this. So, you know, if you alienate people by saying, by the way, your most cherished beliefs are a bunch of bullshit, and now I'd like you to help me out with this other problem. Well, you've, you've lost them, right? So I don't think it's a good strategy in any case. Uh, as I said, I I don't want to define myself by what I don't believe, you know, uh, uh, any more than anybody else would. It's what do you believe, right? So I'm a humanist, a secular humanist or scientific humanist, as I'm taking to calling it now. Uh, I mean, the subtitle of the book is I tried this out, Reflections of a Scientific Humanist. Um, because secular humanism as a, as, a, as a phrase or movement has become too politicized. Again, just uh, moving, shifting toward the far left progressive politics, you're going to leave out a lot of people. I don't think that's a good idea. We want to have a big tent, which we get you know everybody involved. Everybody should be a humanist. You can be a Christian humanist, a Jewish humanist, a Muslim humanist, and so on, believing in human values, universal human rights, and so forth. So a, a set of doctrines that we assert affirmatively, this is the things we believe uh, that are all in encompassing and inclusive is a more positive way to go than than just defining all the things we don't believe, which is a long list. <laughs> right. So, okay, Alvi's error. Well, so in the book, I address some, some of the deeper issues like, well, okay, if you don't believe in God, then, uh, you know, what's the point of life? Where do you find meaning and morals? Where, yeah. where do we ground objective right and wrong and, and, and human values and so on? Okay. So, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time on this in many books uh, and, uh, you know, countering the theist argument that without God, there's no ultimate meaning or morality. So the two M's, M and M, meaning and morality, I address in the book at, at length. So Alvi's error is this idea that without God, uh, without some outside source, then 
you know, in, in billions of years from now, the universe will be dead and gone, and, you know, the heat death of the universe and so on. So what's the point of what I do now if it doesn't matter? If there's no God out there that's sort of keeping track, what what does it matter if I'm nice to you or, or not nice to you? Mm-hmm. And so this reminded me of, of uh, Woody Allen's movie um, in, in which um, – uh, Annie Hall, in which at, 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 toward the beginning of the movie is a flashback to when he was a, a young boy. His name is Alvy in the movie, Alvy Singer. So little Alvy is refuses to do his homework and his mom takes him to the the psychiatrist and he says, Alvy, why won't you do your homework? And he says, the universe is expanding. And the universe is expanding, yes. And, and one day it's going to all blow up. And, and so there's no point in anything. So why should I bother to do my homework? And his mother upbraids him and says, what's the universe got to do with it? We live in Brooklyn and Brooklyn's not expanding. Go do your homework. Right. So Alvy's error is 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 what philosophers call a kind of a categorical error. That is people like William Lane Craig and other theists that make this argument without God. There's no ultimate moral or meaning They're They're operating on the wrong level. Um, that is, they're they're making a categorical level uh, level uh, uh, error. That is to say. It matters to me and you now. We don't live in the hereafter. We live in the here and now. Uh, and, you know, Brooklyn's not expanding, so it matters what you do. It's it's like saying, it, well, without God, then Hitler got away with it. And it doesn't matter what, what the Nazis did to the Jews. The Holocaust is just another event in history. No, it matters to the victims and their families. It matters very much to us today today. Uh, in terms of creating a better society. It matters, matters, matters to us now. And uh, that that's Alvi's error. So much of, I find much of theology that, uh, that makes this kind of uh, categorical mistake, thinking that um, there's some other level where where you find morals or meaning. And, and it, it isn't, it's, it's with us, it's you and I and all of us together now that figures things out. And, and so now you don't need to deny God. I, I, I will I will say there may be an afterlife. I don't know. No one knows for sure. Uh, but it doesn't matter if there is or not, because we don't live in the afterlife. We live in this life. So live it. Make the most of it. Another thing I, I actually wanted to know your views about. I mean, obviously, I'm aware of it because I've been reading your work for a while. But for the listeners and the viewers who are going to watch this uh, You've always been uh, a compatibilist when it comes to issues like mm-hmm. uh, free will. You've been a compatibilist. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, obviously, there are uh, two sides of this coin where, uh, I mean, at least in the new atheist movement, you have one side, you have Daniel Dennett, uh, uh, who refutes the Sam Harris argument. And uh, Sam, so basically, I think Sam Harris, although now he has given up on the Libet example, because I think there was a recent uh, re- uh I don't know. They tried to replicate Libet's results, and they found some problems in Libet's uh, mm, testing yeah. protocol, something of that sort. But still, uh, Sam still stands with the free free will argument. So when uh, I want to connect this to the meaning in life and how uh, I I find this with uh, religious people that the moment you give them the example or the Sam Harris uh, example of uh, free will being an illusion, and we're just uh, you know. A collection of uh, genes and we've just been coming over we live in a deterministic universe and everything is pre-planned so again it uh, the crisis of meaning props up in the religious mind so how do we go about doing giving yeah. them an answer in that case certainly um one aspect of finding meaning and morality is is free will uh you have to feel at least feel like you have volition that you're making choices or else it's not really a moral choice if you had no choice if you had to do what you had to do because of the laws of physics and so forth, then how would you hold anybody accountable? How would you hold a, a, a homicidal, genocidal maniac accountable? And, and they they don't have to hold themselves accountable. Okay, and so that that's one problem. And also w- with meaning, I mean, you have to kind of choose to find your your own meaning by choosing to do things that are are, are more long term and consequential that that give meaning to life. Okay, so I'm a compatibilist like Dan Dennett. I, you know, I'm not a philosopher, so uh, you know some of these arguments and analyses get fairly technical. But um, I, so first, I just recommend Dan Dennett's book, "Freedom Evolves." I think is the best thing he's done on this, where you have the concept of degrees of freedom. That is to say, mm-hmm. instead of thinking of it as black and white, it's either determined or, or completely free. Uh, uh, no, no, no. There's there's degrees of freedom. So. Uh, you know, bacteria have very few degrees of freedom, right? There's only a couple of uh, 
factors in chemistry that sort of drive bacteria to go left or right or up or down or do this or that, consume other chemicals for uh, nutrients and so on. But you can just go right up the scale to, you know, more complex single cell organisms to multicellular organisms to, I don't know, just say insects to mammals, to dogs, to chimps, to us, you know, we have more degrees of freedom than say the dog does. And, but, and even within people, some some people have more degrees of freedom than others. People that are drug addicts, for example, for whatever reason, genetics, brain chemistry, who knows what else. You know, some people are more susceptible to alcohol and drugs than others. And so we, I, I'm willing to acknowledge they have less freedom than I have, let's say, to control their impulse to take drugs. But they still have some degrees of freedom. We know of drug addicts that do overcome it. And we know alcoholics that stop drinking and so forth. So it's obviously doable. And so as you, if, as you, if you employ that concept and then one other, that is to say, um, we are actively involved in the causal net of the universe by understanding the various causes that impinge on human action, including our own. So let's say I, I am aware of the things that make me hungry at a certain time of the day, like I'm going to want to have some chocolate chip cookies or ice cream after dinner, say up between seven and nine o'clock. Well, I, I can now uh, say here it is midday, actively choose to make sure there's none of that in the house if I want to lose weight, because I know future Shermer is going to want those. So current Shermer has got to trick future Shermer into not falling for that, those vectors that cause him to do certain things, right? So that's an example of where I'm I'm freely choosing to be aware of what could cause future me to to succumb to these temptations, right? That That's a way of, of saying uh, that it didn't have to be. That is to say, uh, I don't think the universe is predetermined from the very beginning of the Big Bang or something like that, nor are our lives predetermined. Even though we live in a determined universe with a causal net and all the laws of physics and, and so forth, we are involved in that. We're part of it. And so we make choices along the way, uh, aware of these uh, intervening variables. And so that is where I find that you can hold people morally accountable. Y you knew that it was wrong. I mean, legally, I think the law has tracked this fairly well over the centuries, The McNa starting with the McNaughton Law in England in the 19th century, uh, which turned on this this guy named McNaughton, who the, you know, that came down to, did he know what he did was wrong? And if, if the answer is no, the person is completely crazy or they're insane or they were drug addled or whatever, then we don't have to hold them as accountable as somebody who did. And that's the, you know, the insanity plea. Now, that's not practiced very often. And there aren't very many people that that applies to. But for the most part, we want to know, did you know that it was wrong? Because if you did know it was wrong, then you could have done otherwise. Uh, anyway, that's the the argument I make. I go into a little more detail on that in in the moral arc, but that that's that's it in essence. By the way, Benjamin LeBay, he was a compatibilist. He yeah. made an argument similar to the argument I just made, and similar to Dan Dennett's argument. So, I think much of this turns on what what do you mean by free will, and and what do you mean by the word determinism? And I think a lot of philosophers get trapped or get caught up in the meaning of the words. And they end up going down one path or the other path and, 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 you know, just find that their position is totally defensible and that the other guy is just wrong. I think much of it depends on what you mean by those words. So I'm, I try to define them in a way like I just did. And once you go, OK, I could see that without denying that that we live in a deterministic universe for sure. But we're part of that. Yeah. So I want to connect this now to something that, that I think it was chapter yeah, chapter 21, uh, where you talk about how to build civilization 1.0. And I also want to connect it to the part where you uh, connect it with a tweet that was uh, made by Elon Musk about oh, yeah. that asked him uh, that how are you going to what kind of a government are you going to be having in Mars? And Elon said it will be a representative government now. Now, being in a India, democracy. Yeah, direct democracy and yeah. uh, being in India and 
follow the, the work of Mahatma Gandhi, I think Mahatma Gandhi had a lot of these kinds of uh, small village, uh, de- you know, units and every small village unit has their own way of dealing their things. And they, they, But even Mahatma Gandhi had some sort of a hierarchy envisaged when he said, OK, we'll have something he used to call the panchayat system where there will be a group of people who will represent the entire village. But uh, uh, so so this is a pro- one question I had. So what would you think when if I was to build a civilization from start in Mars, don't you think even the question of free will existing or not, that wouldn't that be a very important factor too when we are deciding yeah. how do we build civilization from scratch? For sure. Politically, we we have to assume that people have some level of volition or else we can't hold them accountable. Um, and so they, regardless of the academic debate in, in philosophy about free will and determinism, all political philosophers start with the assumption that people have some level of volition and have to be held accountable or else you don't have a criminal justice system or else you'd have to modify it considerably. Now, that said, I should point out that I, I, I am in favor of a restorative justice movement. And I think it, it can apply in some cases and that our criminal justice system, particularly in the United States, has gone crazy. You know, we have we've incarcerated the, the largest percentage of our population in the world compared to any other country. We have, uh, you know, we have over two million people imprisoned. You know, it's it's staggering, and and and, and we very much practice kind of an Old Testament eye for an eye type uh, criminal justice, and this is so uh, barbaric and out of, out of whack from other enlightened countries. Anyway, that's it. Back to Mars. Um, I think you know Gandhi's idea. You know, and, and Elon's for a direct democracy. You have these little groups, and that group sit around in a circle and 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 talk about the problems and issues and and and, and settle it with some agreement. That can work, you know, for if you have a dozen or two people, you know, a small group, less than a hundred, you know. But the moment you get up into the thousands or whatever, or you have many of these villages that are linked uh, politically and economically, then then you're going to have conflicts that you know the twelve people sitting around the fire can't resolve. And the problem with direct democracy is that is uh, what Madison called the tyranny of the majority. That is, you just get 51% that says, well, we don't like brown people. So therefore, no more brown people. Boom, gone. Wait a minute. No, no, no. So the whole point of the civil of, of the um, of the of the Bill of Rights is to make this argument. Well, first of all, that you know we don't live in a democracy. The United States is not a democracy. You know, it's a constitutional republic. And of which, uh, you know, the democratic system is part of that. But overarching that is that there are certain things that the majority cannot vote out. It doesn't matter if 99 percent people think slavery is OK. It's it, it's not OK. It's illegal uh, by the 13th Amendment. And so so the Bill of Rights basically says, yeah, we're going to practice a democracy, except here's a bunch of things you can't do, no matter how many people want to do it. OK, so I think. The you know the point of that chapter is to, to explore really the lessons we've learned on the blue planet here over thousands of years of experimentation uh, to determine what we should take to the red planet and you know just think about this for a second it, it's startling we're probably going to colonize Mars yes. it, within this century probably within maybe the first half of this century it that's unbelievable yeah. and by colonize I, I mean just we're going to have people that go there and don't come back. You know, yeah. and, and at some point, it's going to be more than a couple dozen, and then you're going to have this issue. And it's more complicated as I go into that uh, details in the chapter of like, well, who controls the air and the water? I mean, yes. when Europeans came to uh, North Amer- North and South America, th- there was already air and water here, right? So there's, and, and, and pretty much free food on the hoof and in the ground. So that, that was not really an issue. It's going to be way more uh, tricky on Mars where there's no air. And no water and no food, and so you're going to have you know con- political conflicts over the between groups over who controls those things. Anyway, so I explore some of that. It was just kind of fun, um, and I suspect what would be interesting would be to see if Elon, social engineers, as it were, or whoever NASA, uh, uh, wherever ends up there, comes up with something new. I mean, it would be interesting if a thousand years from now, you know, uh, we went to Mars and said, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, democracy. Oh, we gave that up 500 years ago. We found this much better system. It's like, oh, why didn't we think of that? And of course, when people ask me, well, what would that be? It's like, I have no idea. If I knew, I would write about that. But, you know, we're so used to what uh, the systems we practice that it's hard to think of out of the box. 
So now I wanted to go to the last part and I wanted to, obviously you've covered Dawkins and you've covered uh, Hitchens, uh, but I wanted to focus on two people that uh, I, I had a few questions about. So I want to start with Graham Hancock. Now, uh, obviously, I was not aware of Graham Hancock's work, to be very honest, until I saw that four-hour debate that you had with uh, Graham Hancock <laughs> on Rogan. So I, I, I honestly yeah. was not aware of Graham Hancock. And then I started digging into his work. I saw what Gobleki Tepe was, and I just looked into the stuff. Now, uh, obviously, your views on Grant Hancock have changed from the time you debated him uh, at Rogan to the point where you've written uh, in his book. But I had a slightly different issue. It is not about the work of Grant Hancock per se. It is about the process of determining who is the outsider that we're mm -hmm. supposed to take seriously. Because when I was reading this, in my brain, I was going, hang on. But there is no objective way of looking at this. How do we create a standard protocol where, let's say there are many people who really, I mean, uh, just speak booga booga. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's just word salad that a lot of times and you just don't booga get booga. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it sounds like that to me. I mean, you can just go. I mean, to be a, a, a very famous example of that is there's a very famous random code generator of Deepak Chopra on the internet where you can just go online and you can just type a word mm -hmm. and uh, it has quantum repeated three times and it makes sense, but it actually means nothing. But mm -hmm. when an average person, I mean, this is my experience a lot of times in my engagements, like I call myself a Hindu, but Hinduism has a process where you can be a disbeliever and a Hindu, believer and a Hindu. So Hinduism is structured very differently. But when I have discussions with believing Hindus and they give me these examples of uh, Deepak Chopra is just one of them, but there are many other Hindus that, and they sound very profound, but it doesn't right. mean anything in the end. So how right. do we get that standard? So, so you ended up being sympathetic to Graham Hancock, yeah. but how do, how do we create a standardized method for that? Yeah, this is what's known as the problem, the demarcation problem in the philosophy of science. How do we demarcate between science and pseudoscience, for example? I mean, this is much of what we do with, you know, Skeptic Magazine there. Uh, every issue we have, you know, we're, we're dealing with some people on the fringes or the uh, margins who uh, are challenging some mainstream theory. So how do you know that they're not onto something? And so there's no hard and fast rule that I could put in a single sentence or formula or whatever. But basically it comes down to, to what extent are you employing the tools of science to try to answer a question about nature? And pseudoscientists tend to uh, go down the path of, uh, of avoiding the methods of science. That is peer review, experimentation, collaboration with other people. You know, these pseudoscience, they, they tend to uh, operate alone in isolation. They're not part of a community of people that studies this particular area. Their theories tend to be grand and sweeping instead of solving one particular problem. Um, you know, now a, a couple of caveats. One, first of all, as Michael Gordon points out in his his book on pseudoscience, is that you know, no one in the history of the world is ever identified as a pseudoscientist thinking, well, I'm going to get up this morning and go down to my pseudo lab and collect some pseudo facts to test my pseudo theory, right? You know, they think they're they're doing something genuine. And I get letters from all the time corresponding with somebody this week, in fact, who uh, is sure that the moon is hollow and that uh, all of modern physics is wrong in terms of measuring gravity. Gra the theory of gravity is wrong. There's no such thing as time. Mm -hmm. He goes on and on. And, uh, you know, and, and I could tell he's a smart guy from his letters, you know, they, they, they're, they're long and detailed and graphs and charts and, and, you know, he's, so he's not dumb and he's not un, uneducated, but I could tell he knows nothing about physics and geology. And when I ask him, you know, why don't you test this or publish it in a journal? Oh no, those that, you know, they'll never accept it, you know? And, and so he's, he doesn't work in a, a community of geologists or physicists. He doesn't try to solve some specific one little problem here. You know, he has this grand theory to explain everything. Okay, these are signs that probably that's pseudoscience, right? Now, someone like Graham is right in the middle there. He's kind of in between because he's not a crank at all. And he is what he, what he calls an alternative archaeologist, although archaeologists call him a pseudo-archaeologist. Uh, it depends on what you mean by the terms. But basically, he's he's challenging certain um, doctrines of the mainstream archaeological community, that is, how old civilizations are, 
the sequence that civilizations developed and so on. He wants to push it back further. Now he's not a like an a, 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 you know a, ancient alien type guy, you know. And then a miracle happens, and the aliens came. They built the pyramids. You know, he's not like that at all. So and he's been proven right about enough things, like you know that that things keep getting older. He tweets this almost every day. You know, things stuff just keeps getting older. And when you look at it, it's like, hmm, yeah, that's true. <laughs> now, not all of it, you know, like he identified this. Um, this mammoth tooth remains with some chipped rocks that could maybe could have been stone tools in the San Diego area of Southern California at 130,000 years old, which would imply that there were humans in North America 130,000 years ago, which, it go, you know, that, that's 10 times the age of what mainstream archaeologists think. Now, anyways, I pointed out in the Rogan show, um, you know, there's people that challenge that, not the date, but they challenge the the stone tool assumption. There are mammoth, um, there are mammoth finds in San Diego that are 130,000 years old. So what? There were mammoths here. That's that's not shocking. And but the stone tools are not clearly stone tools. They're not obviously chipped like a Clovis point. That's you know beautifully hafted and rounded and in a in a in a point that goes in your palm and the other end is sharp and so on. nothing like that. They're just rocks that you know maybe they roll down a hill and they chipped in a certain way and it's hard to tell. And, um, you know, so it's always right there on the margins where I think Graham probably goes too far, but he goes too far often enough that sometimes he gets it right. Like Gobekli Tepe uh, is an interesting case study because it's always been accepted that um, monumental architecture like the pyramids or Stonehenge had to be built by large communities of people uh, because it takes just a lot of muscle labor to move things. Yes. You know, thousands of people, not a dozen hunter gatherers. So to have thousands of people, you need farming. You need, you know, large collective political um, uh, groups that can make things happen and so forth. But Gobekli Tepe has these monumental structures, uh, but it was built, you know, like 12, 11 to twelve thousand years ago, maybe even older. That you know, there was there was no farming. There were no huge political organizations to make things happen, like the Egyptians or the Druids. You know, so so either the timeline is completely wrong about all of civilization, or hunter gatherers are able to do things that we didn't give them credit for, which is the way I, the place I go to. Although Graham goes in the other direction. Anyway, I'm I'm sympathetic to outsiders because um, I think science can get itself locked into certain paradigms that it's hard to get out of. And it's good to have somebody nudge you once in a while and therefore give them a voice. You don't have to. I mean, it's not required. The government's not going to make you uh, publish people that you don't want to publish in your scientific journal or whatever. But but try to keep an open mind. I think, you know, open mindedness is a good trait for, you know, out of the box thinking to see just in case, you know, our theory, our paradigm uh, the structure that we're working in, our research um, structure is, is has not gone off the rails. We're not, you know, wasting our time for the next six years doing this this particular methodology that actually pans out into nothing. So it's good to kind of keep an, at least one ear open to people that want to challenge it. All right. So another very important figure that has kind of burst into the, at least in the Western world, was Jordan Peterson now. Uh, Obviously, uh, I have been following Peterson. I read Maps of Meaning, uh, albeit I I, I I struggled to go through the book. It was a pretty dense <laughs> yeah, I, book. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't get it, through it either. Yeah, it was a pretty dense book. But uh, in fact, in some areas, I found some problems in uh, in the uses of the Kali example and stuff like that. In fact, I I, I think that was a misrepresentation. I, I don't see uh, actual Hindu mythology even meaning uh, Kali in that sense. But... What I found interesting was uh, Jordan Peterson keeps insisting on uh, tr the word truth all the time. In fact, it was like a two hour conversation with Sam Harris where they could not even agree on what the truth is. And uh, what, I, what I find very interesting is that if, if we can't even agree on something like the truth, then how does one actually function in in a regular day to day life or how does one do science? So, so what, what are metaphorical truths that Jordan Peterson talks about? What are they grounded on? I, and I have never figured out what are they, what is the basis of their yeah. grounding? 
Well, I'm not sure I know for sure, but <laughs> from from what I've been able to discern when I wrote that chapter on on Jordan um, is that well, let, let's do the kind of the simple version of it that there are metaphorical truths, say in literature. So uh, when you know Dostoevsky writes the brothers Karamazov, it, to ask were there really brothers named Karamazov in 19th century Russia? you're asking the wrong question. It, it isn't a true story. It's not a nonfiction work of history. You know, it's a novel, but but it's a novel grounded in certain truths about, uh, you know, the changes in Russian society and, and politics and so on. And, and you know, what, what life was like for regular people living there and, and on and on. Uh, and, and to that extent, there, you know, literature um, explore certain truths about human nature, about human society, about power, deception, love, sex, violence, um, through uh, stories. You know, we're storytelling animals, and, and stories are very powerful delivering, you know, moral homilies, moral values, and so on through stories. So I think that's, you know, at, at the very least, that's what Jordan is arguing, that I, I would agree. Uh, you know, a Jane Austen novel, a Shakespeare play, uh, you, you know, that uh, th these these works of literature um, touch on deep themes in human nature and society that are true. And now there's a study, there's a whole area of evolutionary literary studies, you know, kind of an evolutionary psychology applied to literature. You know, there's certain themes that come up over and over and over in literature. And there's a reason they do It's because they, they they're true, that the themes are true, that is to say. So I, I think that's fine. Um, I think where Jordan gets into trouble with scientists, say, or or more materialists like myself, is you know when when we ask, you know, did someone named Jesus really exist? Was he really crucified? <clears throat> Was he really resurrected? Well, you know, I think uh, Jordan and I would agree. Yeah, probably someone named Jesus really existed. And and he, he was probably crucified because the Romans crucified everybody. But when you get down to this question, was he was he resurrected? You know, did he die and come back from the dead? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, most scientists following Hume would say no. That uh, you know, in kind of a Bayesian reasoning argument, that is to say, you know, you should proportion uh, apportion your beliefs to the evidence, or uh, equi, as Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You know how it, how good is the evidence for the resurrection? It's not good at all. It's not even ordinary, much less yeah. extraordinary. And yet, a hundred billion people lived and died before us. Not one has come back from the dead, or maybe one. So this would be a hundred billion to one extraordinary claim, and the evidence for it is not a hundred billion to one. It's not even one to one. It's just nothing. It's it's very thin. So skepticism is appropriate there. Now here, maybe Jordan, I think, would say, well, it's it's metaphorically true. That is, we should all bear our own cross, or you know, we should uh, you know forgive people that sin against us, or you know, if you want to use that in some metaphorical way, okay. But you know, when Dawkins uh, asks, you know, challenges the idea that the resurrection happened, or me for that matter, um, you, you know, that that's it. We mean it literally. Did it literally happen? And, you know, and, and to say, well, I don't mean literally, I mean metaphorically. Well, you're talking on a different level now. That's, that, you're talking about two different things. And, you know, if we can't get past that, then we're just talking past each other. What I find fascinating in this entire issue with Jordan Peterson and this new phenomena of uh, not taking religion literally is very confusing. I mean, I love the word Eric Weinstein used uh, when he said, uh, accused Jordan Peterson of Jesus smuggling. That was very interesting. I found that word very interesting. What, what is it? Jesus smuggling? Smuggling. Yeah. So oh, Eric okay. actually, uh, yeah, Eric actually yeah, said, so I agree with uh, everything until you smuggle in Jesus. So, oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that was, but yeah. So, so the whole point is that if, if there are these metaphorical truths, that's, Okay, I mean, I mean, I'm fine, but that's not how a religious mind works, right? So the religious right. mind, when when they want to take things literally in religion, they do take things literally in religion, and I, and again, this is the struggle I've always had in my life, and I, so if I would pick up, let's say the. A Veda or a Manuspriti or a Bible or a Quran, and I would be like, okay, oh, I can't read Arabic, right? But but okay, so what does this verse say? And they would be like, oh, the verse says so and so. So you take this verse literally. 
not metaphorically. But then in the other verse, you say, oh, no, no, this translation is inaccurate because in that verse, the God is saying, oh, no, stone the homosexual or throw, uh, you know, mm. do something. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to call it the no true translation fallacy. So whenever the translation <laughs> does not suit me, the translation is wrong. And when the translation suits me, it's right. Uh, uh, suits me, it's right. So so how does one go about the metaphorical truth and fix this problem of literalism? Because obviously, uh, I don't think so. Jordan Peterson the, the, would apply the literalism rule for even the good verses in the Bible, right? Yeah. What, what did you call that? Uh, the no true translation a, fallacy. Yeah, the no truth translation fallacy. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I think that 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 that's that's putting it uh, quite poignantly. Um, this is the problem with with most religious claims in the West, anyway. That is to say, Gould's non-overlapping magisteria only works if religious people don't literally believe what they claim because the moment you say, well, I think the earth is 10,000 years old. Well, we can't have non-overlapping magisteria where the scientists get their claims and the religious people get their claim and they're equally true on some level. No, they're not equally true. One of them is definitely wrong. Right. And, and so the truth is not, you know, add up and divide by two, 4.6 billion on the one hand and 10,000 years on the other. There's a conflict there. And most religious claims are, are not meant to be taken metaphorically, psychologically, mythically true or whatever. And when religious people do that, I'm fine with that. Okay, I, you know, you, you say it's not literally true. It's just your faith tradition. You just believe it for no good reason at all. Kind of the end of the conversation, really. Uh, but then, you know, so, so whatever Eric called that Jesus smuggling. Um, yeah, so that's usually what happens. You know, at some point they sm smuggle in the idea, but this one, this one part here is literally true. And to the religious mind, as you said, you know, what drives people to fly planes into buildings or shoot people or whatever, you know, stab people like in London the other day. Um, they, they, th these are based on things that they think is literally true. My religion is literally correct and yours is wrong. You know, in the case of, of some of these Muslim extremists. And that's the problem with religion. It, it, it kind of moves in that direction. And to the extent that religions, you know, adopt enlightenment values, okay, fine, that's great. But you always have that possibility that they're going to fall back on some what they claim to be literal truths that drive them away from enlightened values more toward these kind of archaic Old Testament type beliefs that are not conducive to a civil society. And, and so I think that's where we get into trouble. So that's why I push back against metaphorical truths or you know, mythical truths or whatever, because they don't always mean it. Oh, all right, Dr. Sharma, I'm uh, conscious of your time. So before we wrap things up, I actually wanted to ask you one last question. So what's next in line after this book? So when is the next book coming up? <laughs> the next book? I haven't started writing anything yet. Uh, uh, I may do something on uh, what is truth. I, I wrote one of my Scientific American columns was titled, What is Truth Anyway? And I address the resurrection issue, <clears throat> but really it's just a, 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 an epistemological question. That is to say, epistemology is underlying everything we do. How do you know what you know? <laughs> and it's the problem is, is none of us are omniscient. We don't know for sure. You know, will COVID-19 do this or that? I don't know. Fauci doesn't know. Trump doesn't know. Nobody yeah. knows. OK, so all of life is grounded on these kind of probabilistic arguments. Well, as it turns out, science has developed tools over the last century or so for how to deal with those kinds of uncertainties. You know, I mentioned Bayesian reasoning and and but m most of statistics and research methodologies is designed to work around this problem, that there are many intervening variables in almost anything you want to study. And therefore, and there's a great level of uncertainty and you will never know for sure, ever, in any area. You know, does smoking cause cancer? Surely it does. I mean, 100%. No, not 100%. Obviously, there's other factors because there's plenty of people that smoke their whole lives and they never get cancer. All right. So why is that? Obviously, there's other factors. Okay. So nobody knows anything for sure. And I think that what is truth anyway is like the biggest question of all. So I may roll up my sleeves and take the next couple of years to tackle that problem in my unique way. That is to say, using all the examples that we study in Skeptic Magazine and, and so on, not a, a book on epistemology that's been done to death. 
by people a lot smarter than I am in philosophy. Now, mine is from a kind of a scientific skeptics perspective. So I think I may move in that direction. All right, that 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 sounds really exciting, especially when the world is under assault from postmodernism and uh, basically yeah. objective truths and objective reality uh, seems to be a thing of the past now. And so I'm <laughs> yeah. really looking, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, Dr. Sharma, once again, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. I actually kind of grew up uh, when I was 20 years old was the first time I came across your work and I've been reading your articles regularly. I used to look forward to your articles in uh, Scientific American. But I think you just stopped a year ago or something. Uh, yeah, uh, last year. So yeah, but skeptic.com, just go there and michaelshermer.com. We post all my uh, publications and work elsewhere. Uh, all right, guys. So it's time to end the podcast. I've uh, kept all the details of uh, Dr. Shermer's book, skeptic.com. If you want to support the Science Alone podcast or the Skeptic uh, Society, I've left the link, the Patreon link uh, right in the description of the podcast. If you want to support my podcast, you know the drill. You can go on YouTube. You can go on Patreon. Until then, I'll see you next time. Namaste. Take care. Goodbye.